Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, we are, if you're watching on YouTube, which we just started, uh, you, uh, you can look down below and you're going to see a link to the Zoom list where, we're, where we actually are. We're coming to you from Zoom. And if you'd like to join us, uh, you can click there and sign up. Uh, so uh, check that out. If you're new to this and you're, this is your first time here and you're a participant, um, you might be probably an attendee. Uh, the, at the attendees and there's panelists. Uh, the difference between them is the panelists showed up early. Uh, so um, the panelists uh, get here. We open the doors at six o'clock and all of us just kind of have a roundabout conversation for the first half hour, 40 minutes. Uh, between 6.30 and 6.40, we hand out the uh, Discord link. Discord is where about 500 of us keep talking after this. So uh, so if you want to join the Discord, come another day. Uh, it expires at 7, so by the time I uh, do this announcement, it's already gone. Uh, but uh, you can come back at between, at, I would come at 6.30. Anytime between 6.30 and 6.40 is generally when we uh, do the Discord link. And then after that, we do mic checks. Uh, so we go through mic checks. A lot of you probably watched us go through that. Um, if you are here after mic checks uh, begins, uh, we're not going to bring anybody else in. <laughs> so, so that's the cutoff. So I'd be here, I'd definitely be here by 640 uh, Pacific Standard Time uh, to make sure that you're uh, part of the mic check. Uh, and once you're a panelist, um, you need to keep your video on and stay attentive. Uh, so if you're going to join um, the panel, just know that you need to keep watching and keep acting like you're part of the show. Uh, if you stop doing that, we might drop you out. <laughs> so, so, um, so that's kind of the uh, uh, that's kind of the process there. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, we've got uh, you know the way it kind of works here. We've got six to seven. We kind of get ready. Seven to eight, we do Q and A. Um, so there's a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, use that Q and A heavily. Um, you want to look at questions there, vote them up. Um, we spend more time on the questions at the beginning of the hour than we spend on the bottom of the hour. So you want to make sure that you're, uh, um, because we have, we see, oh, there's only five questions and we've got an hour. So we'll spend 10 minutes a question. But by the end, we've got 10 questions and, and 10 minutes and we answer them all as yes, no, green, black. So, um, so anyway, so you want to make sure that, uh, uh, you uh, get your questions in early, vote on the questions that you think are the, uh, uh, that, that you like there, and, um, and then we'll, uh, we can kind of keep moving through that. So uh, the uh, eight to nine o'clock hour is when we actually do kind of a more focused discussion. So we talk about something that we think is important for a whole hour. Um, today, we've got Carl Gass. He's going to talk about prepping participants. And so, um, so we're going to have we're going to uh, be doing that uh, at eight o'clock. And so we're going to be talking about prepping people, getting them ready, uh, how we how we make sure that hosts and guests and anybody that's going to show up on on screen and and present materials are ready for the show. Carl and I have worked together on many big shows, <laughs> so so it's good to have Carl here. Um, and uh, and then at uh, next week I mean, tomorrow we have Jeff Jeff Keithley. He's going to be talking about cloud production again. We didn't feel like we hit that quite as hard as we could have, so we're going to do it again. He, just there's so much to cover. So uh, so so Jeff Keithley will be in uh, tomorrow to do that. Saturday is the long day, which is that we have uh, Nick Justishin is going to be talking about Unreal. Uh, Steve Bay is going to be talking about Final Cut. A new one we've got Leland Best talking about VMix at eleven o'clock. So that'll be the uh, that'll be the long day there. And so. Um, that's how it works. And so we, we if you uh, if you want to invite people, if you think this is something that's cool, if you get to the end of this and you say, well, someone else might might like it, you can uh, put this, you can share this link with them, and uh, they can also join the party. Anyway, without uh, further ado, we're going to hand it off to Chris. Chris, what are you? What kind of questions do we got here? Oh, well, actually, I want to ask something first. I want to ask something first. How did uh, how did yesterday go? This is my first day. I didn't get Chris to do it. Chris was great. Chris was great. Did Chris knock it out yeah. of the park? It was really right. good. Thanks What's for the letting me drive job? the car, Dad. Thanks for letting me borrow the car. <laughs> Thanks for driving it. It was so you know, and, and I just want to say, you know, like we, uh, yeah, great, great work, Chris. I heard a lot of great things about uh, about yesterday, and and I want to I want to thank Chris, and I also want to thank the panel. You know, I think that one of the things that we're working on with the structure is a we've been slowly, you know, Phil's going to do tomorrow. Um, you know, Chris did yesterday. There'll be a couple days, not next week, but the week after that I'll miss. And so we, you know, we knew that production would eventually catch up with me uh, and I wouldn't be able to be here absolutely every day uh, straight for forever. Um, but I don't think it's going to be that bad. I think it's just a couple of little um, storms that I have. And then after that, I shouldn't, shouldn't miss very many. But what's great about it is that we've got some great folks that bo both can host that have, that have kind of been part of this. And the pan it says a lot to the panel and to everyone here um, of making it easy for them to do their job, you know, and I think that a lot of times I may seem pretty heavy handed about the way hosts are treated. It's really not about me. It's about the days that I'm not here and making sure that they have the support that they need. So, um, uh, so I just want to thank everybody 
uh, for making making yesterday great, and um, and I'm I'm excited that it worked. <laughs> so <laughs> so so there have been times when I walked away and I and I look at it, and I go, oh, I don't know if this is going to work or not, and I'm 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 super excited that it, that it, that it'll work, so that I've got a little freedom and we can keep on changing. And I know that it probably had a little bit of a different feel, which I think is amazing. I think that it should change a little when I do Mac break instead of Leo. It definitely has a different feel, and so I think that that flavor and that change will be good um, now and again. And so uh, so anyway, so thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thanks to the panel, and thanks in advance to Phil for uh, handling uh, handling tomorrow. We'll so, um, <laughs> all right, Chris, what what are the questions? All right, Jeffrey Reyes says uh, in. By the way, thanks oh, and for and I just want to make sure that that uh, everyone knows this is Thursday. I, I, my days have been a little off. Oliver will be here from nine to ten to talk about Memo Live. Right. So, um, to answer your questions, he wasn't here last week, and I I doing it off the top of my head and forgot that it was Thursday. So Oliver again is going to be here from nine to ten. Anyway, go ahead, Chris. All right, so Jeffrey Reyes says uh, in Zoom, can you get a separate window with the speaker view and one with the grid view? I'm on a Mac. Answer easy, yes. You need two monitors though. You need to have it set for it two only, monitors. But that only works for participants, uh, for panelists. Right, For if you're uh, in a meeting, well, so if you're in a meeting, um, you can do it. And if you're a panelist, you can do it. Um, go ahead, Roscoe. That was a good point. Yeah, don't forget if you have an iOS device, you can log in on the exact same account and you can use that iOS device in grid mode and your main monitor in speaker mode. Yep, absolutely. Andrew? Um, it's a related question to go with it. Uh, if, if you have, if you're recording your Zoom meeting, is there a way to, uh, you know, when you're switching to have a, a gallery view and then speaker view for, for the participants, is there a way to record that edit or because they seem to only get the speaker view? Well, if you change your view of it, if you change to gallery view, uh, if the host changes to gallery view, the, the end participants are going to see gallery. They do, but when I press record to record the actual uh, meeting or the webinar, at the end, they were, uh, the recording that I got back from Zoom only showed the, uh, the full screen. Uh, I don't know uh, why that would be the case. I mean, we definitely, I've definitely seen it change based on my edit. Like what, what is sent to the webinar participants? It's a little different. Maybe it might, might, it might be different for meetings too. So when no, I, this, what this sent, is a webinar. So that's what on webinar, what I've definitely seen is a, is a shift between them. When I'm, when I shift my view as host, it should shift the view in the record, you know, as you know, it's, it's what the participants see and what YouTube sees um, is generally what the host is driving. Go ahead, Leland. There are a couple different settings for the way Zoom records. It's in your account settings. I'm going to leave a link for those options that are available in Zoom under their support settings for recording layouts. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah, absolutely. George, go ahead real quick. No, I just want to respond to Andrew, Andrew real quick. What I've been doing for clients is just record on two separate machines, gallery on one, and just cut on the main machine. That way I have, um, when I go to re-edit it, I can match the shots up. So you're and recording then, internally? Yes, I'm recording to, to two machines. I'm not recording to the cloud, so I'm recording on a separate machine mm -hmm. in gallery view, and then using my main machine for um, cutting in between the gallery and singles. Yep. And and uh, know that if you also, if you want to have a, uh, a second mo uh, screen, but you only have one, one monitor, uh, you can get for like 15 bucks, you can get a little thing that emulates an HDMI uh, monitor, plug it into your computer, and now Zoom will let you open that second window. It'd be nice if Zoom just let us just spawn windows and put what we want them in, into them, but maybe someday. Anyway, um, ne next question. Chris? The, oh. yeah, 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 the um, little tiny button. Didn't want to use any extra buttons. Okay, yeah. uh, uh, Johnny Estilla says, um, I'm looking for a hardware encoder with RTMP, SRT, H.264, H.265. I know Alex would say get a Makito. Can someone recommend anything more affordable than that? I would not say get a Makito. I would say get oh. a link. <laughs> you know, so send it, to, send, send it to Amazon and have it. And and, uh, and it. I, I'm not a big, I, I, I've, used, I've used the Makitos and I'm, I'm not a super big Makito fan. So and what's it's, it's, what what did you say the link is that the transparent one you keep holding up yeah that's the transparent one that i hold up we now have little cases for them so see we 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 actually took old yellow brick uh cases and um or marty did marty brennis um uh, figured this out so now but th this is what i would i mean for small like i just want to do it see it's transparent it's it's not only is it a cloud encoder it's it's very cloud like it's because of my key um anyway to me, that's the most flexible one. We, we used it in a, oh, look at that. Um, 
Guy has them. How long did it take to get Guy when you ordered it? Um, it took about three weeks. And right now I'm having an issue with it actually showing up in my account. Um, I need to send him a message because I went through everywhere and it it's supposed to just be attached to your account and you don't have to do any setup. And so I was excited to be like sending these so, out and being like plug and play. And it's not. So you, are you sure that you're on the West Coast uh, instance of AWS? That's. I assumed I was, but I'm new to AWS. You would assume so I'm, that. I'm still learning. Oh. You would assume. So. <laughs> okay. So, no, no. The only reason I say that is I went round and round myself for like uh, two days trying to figure out why we had, we were changing all our admin settings and everything else and we couldn't figure it out. When you go to AWS, when you, when you just, just type AWS and then you log in, I ended up in the East Coast server and the East Coast server, everything showed up except for my device. Um, when I went to the West Coast server, the device was there. So maybe that will hopefully that let me know tomorrow if that fixes it or try Thanks it now while, that, while we're that's talking. Probably, that's probably it. I feel there was, dumb. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I'll, no, you shouldn't feel dumb because it was like I, we were racking our brain. We were like, I have no idea why this isn't working, you know, and and uh, uh, anyway, so it, it it fixed it. But you have to be on the West Coast. If you're on the West Coast, you have to be on the West Coast server or it won't show up because it's attaching to a specific, uh, you know, region as it, as it goes through. Uh, Phil? We definitely need that AWS primer. Working on it. We're going to have those guys on. So we're going to have them on and, and it is, but once I, once we got it working, it's kind of magical because you can just, you're sending one stream in, into the, into AWS. And then you're just like, oh, I'm going to all magic all these is things. Once you know the trick. Right, right. It's like, but then oh, I'll just send this on. And we did, uh, uh, we split, um, you know, English and Spanish, and we did a bunch of other things. And soon there'll be uh, multi-language, as they said. So you'll have to be able to put up eight language or up to eight channels in, and then pick off the channels that are coming in and send them off to other things. And so, so there's a lot of uh, um, uh, cool things. But that's probably what I would do as a single. Uh, for me, uh, does anyone else have other little hardware encoders that they would want to use? Less expensive, Beiju, Leland, then George, and then we'll move on. Uh KiloView has a couple. They just announced an update on Facebook that it can do NTI locally, it can do SRT, and it can do RTMP. And it's not Who really expensive. Again? I think it's about KiloView. Uh, they are basically Kilo the View? OEM for, uh, they, I think they're the OEM for new tech. Okay, Leland? I was going to say the same. The Magewell would be a similar priced item as well that would work. Does the Magewell, does the Magewell standalone? It's a standalone encoder? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I didn't, I didn't even know they made, I think when I was buying lots of them, they were just little, dongles uh george oh no they've got them. good i would give the um, aj helo a shot i've been using two of them for over two years now and no issues it doesn't have h265 but they might be able to come in an update does it have srt no srt yet so just i think it's just an h264 encoder isn't it it's just a h264 encoder yeah yeah absolutely victor follow-up question for noob is this only for mere mortals or is it only for high production uh, type things? Right. I mean, the use all of these, link. Oh, the link. No, no, no. Anybody can use it. I mean, it's, it's, and again, I think that it's just going to give you more flexibility. Here's what, here's what I would say is that it, it's going to be easier. And I admit that I had been asking for this for like four or five years, you know, from, from elemental, like every meeting was like, Hey, I need a little box that I can just send. Cause my issue was like, for instance, what I did with this, um, high school graduation <laughs> is that they asked for some help. I don't want to go down and manage their encode. I don't want to do anything about it. I, you know, I'm happy to help from my house, but I don't want to do anything. So I just gave Marty these boxes and he just sticks them in there. He plugs them into the internet. He plugs his SDI signal in. I see it. I turn the thing on and I just leave it on all day. Like, okay, there you go. You know, like, you know, and, and now he's got it streaming to his YouTube in jest. It's just constantly populating the YouTube ingest whenever it wants, but he doesn't have to deal with anything on his end. You know, so I, I, you know, taking away having to have an encoding engineer on the ground is the thing that, you know, like you can just send it to someone, you can mail it to someone if they have DHCP and a, and a, uh, you know, fast enough internet connection, they just plug the internet into the back, plug power in, plug SDI or HDMI in, and we're done, you know, and, and it's, you know, and then you see it on the other side and then you do all, and again, it's not, depending on how much you stream, it could be less expensive than restream. It could be more expensive than restream. It's about a buck an hour, you know, um, yeah, to, to, to stream it. So it just depends on how much streaming you're doing. But the point is, is that, um, is that when you buck an hour per ingest or whatever that you're sending out. But the, but the issue is, is that by you doing the simple things and figuring it out, and it did, I, there was a lot of swearing that was involved for me to get it the first time started up. And I'm going to, I've just been in so much between this and so many other productions right now, this 
next two weeks or, or so is pretty intense for me. Um, I haven't been able to make my little video about the link or how to use AWS, but I will. But once you get over that hump of getting it going, the big thing is, and it's like, a, you know, I know that if I do a 10 minute video, you'll, it'll save you a lot of time. So I'll work on that this weekend. I'll just sit down and do a little, like, it won't be very clean. It'll just be me. Like, here's how you set the link up to, to set up an event to YouTube. But, but the, um, uh, once you get over that hump, now you have all this creativity of, of the AWS background and you can keep on learning slowly. You can do something simple, but keep on going, oh, I want to add this. I want to add another, another output. I want to do other processing. I want to do, you don't have to learn it all at once. You don't have to become an AWS mass, you know, like, you know, uh, amazing person to do it. You just have to, you know, slowly, um, you know, pick up speed. Go ahead, guy. I was curious if you knew how much more efficient um, the Zixi, I, I assume it's Zixi that's on the back end of that Amazon yep. uh, device. It is. Okay, so <clears throat> how much more efficient, because the question was uh, about H.265, and I remember when I had a Teradek encoder, I had to send it up to core, and it was a lightweight, you know, it was about half the, the bandwidth yeah, of H.264, which was great, but then I had to transcode it, and I had to pay for transcoding hours up in the cloud, and then there was an added latency, so... That's what my excitement was about the AWS was how fast can we kick up a low bandwidth stream if we're over cellular or something. And then yeah, it's so the, the big thing about Zixi and what they're working on as they move forward, which they talked about when they were out talking to us, is that it, it can it can intelligently scale up and down that. If, so if your bandwidth is fluctuating, it's going to you know change the bit rate on, on, you know, so you're telling what a maximum bit rate you want it to go to, but it can it can kind of go up and down based on what it's there and it's going to do the best it can, but it does it pretty well you know, as far as giving you the best image you're going to get for the for the bandwidth that you're using. And the, the most important part of this, as we go down the path, and this is for those of you who use Apple, <laughs> you know, stuff for other things too, but owning the whole pipeline makes a difference. And so it's not where the link is right now. I'm throwing the ball where the ball, where the receiver is going, not necessarily where the receiver is. And, and what I mean by that is, is that having, owning the last little bit, so AWS being on one side, and then going into the cloud means that you can drive this thing. And as they improve it with eight channels and with other con controls and other other bits, you're going to have more and more and more and more control of the edge of, of where that ingest is going. Um, because there's a lot of things you can do when you don't have to, a lot of what limits us at, as encoding folks is to, is that we're using two pieces, a piece of hardware and a piece in a cloud um, instance that aren't owned by the same company and aren't being developed at the same time. You know, and so you have to use these old protocols to get back and forth. RTMP is a very old protocol <laughs> that we're using. It's lowest common denominator, you know, and we're stuck with stereo and we're stuck with the, you know, like there's all these things that we get stuck with when we know that we, it's going to be a, a uh, owned pipeline. We can send all kinds of complex data. Now, I don't know what they're going to put in. I've made lots of requests. So we'll see if, 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 if half of my requests go in, it's going to be amazing, you know, to do that. And again, it just takes it off. Now you are going to get it's really five seconds is what you're giving up, you know, to get, and I would say you know, it's five seconds is, is what you're losing over the two and a half that you would normally lose going to straight in. Um, so there's, you know, there's seven and a half seconds before the, at least seven and a half seconds before the buffer on YouTube. Right. Um, and then after that, it's all buffer. So, so you just have to, um, but most of the time, it depends on the size of the event that you're doing. That doesn't really matter. I mean, if you look at the questions that are being asked right now, we're going to be way more than seven seconds behind, you know, because <laughs> the only time low latency matters is interactivity, in my opinion, you know, like, and because a lot of times you're watching, you're watching your TV at anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds to sometimes even a minute behind real, you know, what's live is still going through a bunch of other delays on the way to you. And some of it's a seven second delay to make sure they can take out swear words. And then there's other, then there's other delays in transport and everything else. And so you're not seeing it live anyway. Um, and uh, for small streams, that real-time interactivity makes a difference. Uh, there are a handful of times when the audience is interacting with the actual event, which it might make some of a difference. But for the most part, if you're doing really large events or larger events, the latency becomes less and less important, you know, in, in my opinion. So uh, next question. Hasmuk says uh, he, he used ATM for his fitness session iPhone 11 HDMI out will not show in landscape, although the iPhone 7 does work. Beju suggested some other apps for, as a workaround. He loves the, the wide angle of the 11. Is there any way to get landscape out of an iPhone 11? I right, go ahead, Leland. 
There is not. They've actually removed that feature from the 11. It was a, there was an orientation lock on the older plus models, but supposedly after research that we ran into as well with that same problem, it's not available on the 11. So you're going to have to look at a different device or a different app that may be able to control the image for you, but you're going to have right. to experiment. You shine. Uh, sorry, you can use iFilmic Pro. I just tested it while you're talking and it's if you turn it it's actually uh, turn it i feel like i feel like bro know how to handle the signal out and 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 if it and when you do that do you get a clean aperture is there any of the filmic uh is it is, is it the ui uh, gone is the ui gone and the ui is gone yeah it's 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 perfect it's really yeah. is it filmic uh, pro or i filmic pro i filmic pro yeah I film it pro. Yep. Okay. So you yep, can there you also go. record it locally and everything. There it is. That's, that's your solution. All right. Next yep. question. Uh, Scott favorite says quick fix for eyeglass prompter reflections for talent with no time. Uh, Roscoe. Make sure I got the right window. Uh, you got to just, uh, sorry, I got to take my nephew's hat off. Um, you just click your glasses like this. I'm I'm overemphasizing it, but the only thing you can do is tilt them a little bit like that. No, most of the time we won't notice that they're high on the the backside isn't high, especially if they have long hair. We won't see the back, but it will change the reflection angle. We do it all the time with actors, or we um, just have them get rid of them. Uh, Bill, yeah, I do the same thing. The other thing is if you have time, he said specified no time. This doesn't work. If you get something with really reflective glasses, you can take them to any mall optical shop, and they can do an anti-reflective coating in a day for cheap. Excellent. All right, go ahead, Yashai. Uh, sometimes try to play with the camera angle a little bit without uh, killing the look. Sometimes you can uh, get away with the... Or light angle. Very... Yeah. <clears throat> so and so uh, Oftentimes the light angle, it's... For most glasses, the light angle moving yes. a couple inches, it will, will take it out of that. Yeah, um, make a big difference. So yep. go for that. Absolutely. Next question. Uh, Jonas Doutel says, is there an open source cloud vision mixer? Yes. Uh, oh, open source. No, no, I don't know of any open source ones. Does anyone know of any open source cloud? I know there's definitely cloud vision mixers, but I don't know of any, uh, any yeah, Jeff says no. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. And I, that would worry me. Yeah, Beju? Yeah, the workaround is basically just running OBS in the cloud, in a cloud instance somewhere, which people are using. A lot of live streamers are doing that. They're putting OBS in the cloud. They're streaming it and they have it automated that if the signal cuts out, it cuts to a cutaway slide or something. Got it. Live stream. There you go. So OBS would be the closest thing. Three, next three. question. Uh, next question. Dave Miller says, when the mic check is done, a meter is shown that shows an absolute decibel level. I'm wondering how these meters are calibrated. How do we know one meter measures the same level as another? Mickey, do you want to say anything about your meter? Uh, I don't know exactly what he means about absolute decibel level. Um, but if you look at, like, let me spotlight the WNS. Think peak levels. Yeah. Yeah. Where is the WNS? We're, I think we've reached peak Mickey right here. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's talking, talking about he's switching doing... in meters and he's switching Jesus. to the meters. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All Go right. Ahead. So yeah, we see here um, at the at the very bottom, there's a true peak meter, which is uh, the actual like level that that the the actual peak level that the that uh, WNS is. Uh, sorry, it's not WNS. Uh, WLM is is getting. Um, and above it, we have the blue and white one, which is momentary, which is a weighted meter um, that is right now focused on, on dialogue, on voice. And it is an average of the past three seconds. So that's the difference between uh, those two meters. I don't know exactly what he means about absolute decibel level, though. It's not gonna. You're not going to be able to control absolute de decibel. It's, it's what we're measuring from you know, what, it's, what is that computer is receiving internally. Uh, absolute de decibel level will be dependent on what where your speakers are set to, but absolute, de it, you know, there's not really an absolute. I think that a lot of times what we're looking at and is what we deem as useful for this event. You pick a number and you just, the the big thing is to definitely not change it. Uh, Yashai, uh, actually, I just want to add to what Mickey said. Uh, the the short term, basically, like he says, is the three second. The long term, somebody having a long conversation, that's going to give you an average. The other thing is important to uh, fix the target. And the true peak is really when you go to analog 
uh, side. So the tropic is is when you going over the zero uh, point, and that's you want to try to lower that there to control the 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 peak there. And does anyone want to tackle LUFS? Anyone want to explain it a little bit? There's there's requests for some explanation of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think I can. Uh, uh, Go, uh, Bill. Bill? Yeah, it, it's a loudness standard for broadcast. That's where it came from. And it's very complicated technically. But if you're submitting to broadcast and, and you, you want to be within those margins or you can get disqualified. I've yeah, it's, uh, LUFS is not uh, an, uh, a, a, an actual reading of the levels, electrical levels, but it's weighted towards a certain thing, which is usually dialogue. And in, in terms of long-term, the long-term uh, measurement for, for shows, especially deliverables for broadcast, we have a, a spec for short-term that we must hit and also a spec for long-term, which is the length of the entire show that we must hit. Uh, you're shy, real quick. Okay, yeah, loft is basically the measurement of perceived loudness. And the perceived loudness, the best way to do it, you go to uh, like uh, Spotify, you go to YouTube and they give you what they're expecting is the perceived loudness. And then when you when you put your meter, you want to you want to hit that because if you go over that, what they do, they reduce your volume and basically they're playing with your with your audio. So you want to basically get the, the 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 information from there and then adjust yourself to that. Go ahead, Phil. And will a will a normalized function in a post processing hit that or is not that not what normalizing does no it won't i mean it will get you very very close but lufs again is a uh, is really more um designed to to measure as as you i was saying perceived loudness ex uh, as opposed but, but to there's not a normalized to luffs it's it's, it's no, you it's, can you can go ahead Yishai. yeah it's actually it, it, it has few ingredients that can control the, the perceived loudness. One of them is harmonic, the dynamic, everything you touch. When you touch EQ, everything is all contributing to the end result of the perceived loudness. So, so it's, it's not that straightforward. So it's basically how you do all your, how you cook your mix. That's how it affects the end result of uh, loudness, the loss. Andrew? Andrew? Yeah, uh, another big contributor to perceived loudness is the compression. So that's why sometimes you're know, watching TV and then the commercial sounds a lot louder. It's not necessarily, a, if you look at the levels, they might be about the same as the program, but what they do is they compress everything up and bring it up. So now you're hearing the commercial, sounds like it's blasting, you're turning down the TV, but it wasn't louder than the actual show, just it had much less dynamic range and it's all pushed up. So every, even the quiet stuff sounds loud. So you perceive it as a louder sound. And uh, they're trying to avoid that so people don't get annoyed. There's a, I think we're gonna we're gonna table this one for a whole hour of talking about levels, about talking about uh, meters. And we, I know we've been I've been promising it, but it's coming soon. So uh, next Yay. next question. Okay, that was fun. Uh, Michael Tucker says, has anyone set up an ATEM Mini in a VMix call as a participant? Is, is my mic working? Recipient, not a participant. He has a recipient. Uh, but he also corrects it in a twirl down. Oh, got it. And he got says, it. Yeah. So call. It should work. I mean, it, it should be, you know, you're you're doing a vMix call. Um, you're supplying, you're on, the, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about being on the other end and having an ATEM mini that is then feeding into the, the web return. Uh, I, I, I haven't done it, uh, but it should work. I mean, I don't think that there'd be any issue because it's going to show up as a webcam. Um, the vMix call on the far end is going to see it. It should see it as a webcam. I mean, if, if you do vMix call uh, and yeah, we'll test it soon. I, I'm going to have a bunch of vMix instances but soon. Point of clarification, the ATEM Mini um, uh, emulates a 720 webcam and a Pro emulates a no, 1080 I think they both they both do 1080. Okay. Yeah, and so the it's the web presenter that does 720. Um, both of them uh, do do 1080, and so they they should just look like webcams to vMix. Uh, but if if you can see it in Hangouts or Meet, Meet is using basically something very similar to WebRTC. If you can see it in Meet, you should be able to see it in a call or or any kind of WebRTC client. Uh, you should be able to see it there. Go ahead, Matthew, and then we'll move on. Um, just if you haven't tried the beta version of vMix Call, you gotta look into that. It's awesome. 
It's a lot of what, really cool extra features in it. What did they add? So if you go to beta.vmixcall.com, it brings you to the beta side. It allows you to choose your camera, choose your microphone. All the stuff that's driving us crazy about vmix call is uh -huh. all pretty much solved. I've asked for a, a tally light or an on-air light of some sort on the return so your speaker knows when they're on air. Um, there is a workaround to use a, 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 an overlay to do that, but I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Yeah, we're, we're working on, basically, the, I mean, the main reason I'm going to vMix is so that I can uh, customize everybody's return. You know, like each per each caller's return is going to have the data that I want to send them and the, you know, a whole bunch of screens. It's not just one yeah. little thing. It'll be uh, their notes, their, you know, you know, questions, the, you know, and designing a whole screen that comes back. Now I'm doing, that would be hard if you have a bunch of callers, unless you do it the way I do it, which is you buy a computer for every call. <laughs> you know, so every caller has it. So that, that way I have a ton of output, you know, that's, that's available to me. Yeah. So it, you need a lot of machines to do that. That's yep. That's sure. what I'm doing. Oh, anyway, Phil. The other right. thing it adds is um, screen share for the caller. Um, so that's really nice to have. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, next question. Uh, Jason says, what is the best way to play back a pre-recorded video in a Zoom webinar without the participants experiencing lag or choppy video? Well, so you have, so the way Zoom works is that you have to choose between frame rate and resolution. So if you play it out as a video, like you have to play it through a web presenter or through uh, Mimo Live or, or vMix or OBS or whatever you're gonna use as an in-between, if you use it as, a, as either a, some kind of virtual camera or a hardware or a webcam, if you play that out into Zoom, you know, the way our videos work, it will prioritize the frame rate. If you do a screen share, it will prioritize resolution. And the higher the resolution that you set it, if you give them, a, you can give it a 4K, it'll try to push 4K to everybody, um, but it will lower the frame rate because it's capped at about three and a half megs a second. So it's just, it just says, I'm going to give you this. And then it's just going to, it's just making choices between the two. So you just have to decide, you know, whether you want frame rate or whether you want resolution, but you can't have both. You know, you can't, you know, like that would make it a much higher bandwidth requirement than what, uh, what Zoom is, is allowing. And that's partially for the user end user to make sure that you're not, asking them to, to play something out that they can't handle. You'd have a lot of people complaining if, if you did that. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, if you're, um, if you're going out from share screen, there is a tiny little box right but, before you go on. And we have played with this and, and we get better results that way when that box is not checked. But if you're I doing, if you're, if you're doing, if you're doing, but the problem is, is that what the bo what that box says is treat my screen share like video. Right. But Which is the I same would, as what we're doing if you're piping it in through a through a ten mini. Right, and and so what I what I would say is is if this is a one time instance where you're just doing this as as a one off, you know that's probably about the the best you're going to get. Yep. But move outside and have your video come in in a different way and mix it uh, either through representer or mini because I mean just philosophically, uh, I just give people a signal. I really don't care what they're using. Uh, you just give people a signal because it's just too hard otherwise inside the app. It's I I find the I mean I, and I've had to do it recently. I I find that the screen share is garish. I, I'll use it when I have to, like this morning before the show. But I I I, I do not like the the way that they manage screen share at all. Uh, Roscoe. Yeah, and just make sure you're using your biggest, baddest, best connected computer too, because sometimes people try and share from their laptops that are not well connected. And it slows down. Yeah, but the main thing you yeah, go ahead, Chris. If you were to switch to an external service to put a link in, is there something similar like what Frame.io has that you can have a synced playhead amongst all your participants outside of Zoom? Um, not anything that's easy. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that I do want to do uh, soon uh, when my when, when the storm that I'm in kind of slows down is to do Netflix w with everybody where we where because we can sync Netflix there's the there's a there's a little app there's a little extension for Chrome that lets you have everybody jump in and watch a movie together you know watch a Netflix together I'm surprised that Netflix hasn't just bought them but um, anyway or, or killed them one or the other uh, but I think that uh, being able to have a group discussion about and what I'm trying to do is figure out a way if I can get some of the movies that are in there that I know people who worked on them is get them like let's all watch the movie and have a, you know, be hang out with a bunch of folks that 
actually built the movie and and talk about it while we're going on so we're we're um so that's the only way i can netflix is the only place i've seen where you can easily sync the playhead um in that in that play out so we could watch dark fate with chris summers oh yeah oh yeah i love, oh, I love yeah. me let's, some let's, uh, or, or we'll share well first thing well, first my kill my father is a little little dark anyway be, yeah yeah we can do that one though that would be a, that, that, that would be a good one so all right all right next question i this feels greek to me has anyone configured a high spec DIY vMix PC. Looks like I can get the right parts assembled at SuperLogix for a great price. Is that reasonable or is there a lot of special sauce in something like production bot? I don't know what that means. Um, Leland, is hard. do you build your own or do you? Or do you uh... I do build my own and it's basically, you can go either way, Intel or AMD, but vMix, keep in mind, vMix is basically configured specifically for Intel. So I would highly recommend if you're going to build a new vMix machine, you're either going to go high-end AMD or an i7 or higher for that regard. But there are specs, reference machine specs on the vMix website. Just Google reference specs for vMix and you should have all the parts you'll need. That's great. Uh, next question. I also want to keep in mind, uh, remind people that the up, the thumbs up in the Q&A, we have almost 300 people here and we're getting like two and three votes. So you got to vote. Yeah, vote. If, 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 you, if you think we're wandering Otherwise, around, not the answering best the questions, questions will be relegated to the speed round. And that's bad. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't want to Michael that. Casey says, um, it, it, also, Michael, your question's a little long, but it's a good one. He works in a library. He gets 15K grant to build a small studio to live stream to YouTube and also save the videos. Uh, it's for kids and adult programming, but sometimes they want to be able to put two or three people on a little set to talk. How should he spend his money? And he, and he says, he hey, you tweeted to me yesterday. He, 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 so so he, he tweeted and I said, hey, just come on office hours. I was, I was like, I was like, don't like, I'm not going to. He said, it, it, he asked if I, if I would consult. And I was like, I'm not going to charge you for that. Just come up on office hours. So here's the question. So uh, and, and, and hopefully you'll join Discord because you, as you go through the trials and tribulations of starting your own thing, um, you know, here's what I would here's what I would consider. Um, and other people can, I'm going to give my version of this. If, if someone gave me 15,000 and then other people can argue with me. But what I would do is probably get um, an ATEM Mini. And I would either get three or four, uh, I get three or four 6K, three or four of the Blackmagic 6K cameras. He says would, he says he doesn't need all the 4K. He says 1080 is fine. I, I, I understand, but I'm just saying that those okay. cameras, the, the problem is, is you, the, you need at least those cameras because that's how you shade the cameras. You can't shade anything less and they're not very expensive. So, so the, the big thing is, is that in 15K, what you can afford is a, a mini, maybe even a mini pro. If you, if you want to go down and you can get a mini pro, you either get, I would get three of the 4k cameras or three of the 6k cameras. I would get three 6k cameras because it's a better thing. Then you need some lenses. I would get probably, you know, 24 to seventies. Uh, Sigmas are fine. Like you can get, I mean, I get Canon's, but the L series, but they're expensive and they're going to cost as much as the camera. So you can get some Sigma 24 to 70 lenses, maybe get one that's like longer 7,200. Um, you know, lens there, you get a, um, I would get probably a mix pre 10, um, so that you have a bunch of, you know, and get some mics for it. You can get a mix pre six if you want, but I mean, I would get something that you, you can do a round table, you know, with that, um, to, to make that work. Auto um, mix. that's going to, well, you have auto mix built into it. You, we want to get auto mix or mix assist is what they yeah, call it. They call um, it yeah. and, uh, and if, you know, if you really want to go crazy, you can get the, you know, you can get the um, noise assist on on it now. So so now you can take the bus that's going out and and get rid of a lot of your background noise if you need to. Um, and then and then you have then you need a laptop. You know that's gonna you know kind of manage some of those things. You don't technically need one if you have the pro, the mini pro. You can just that whole thing would be you know self contained. You'll need a couple monitors. I think that that would fit inside of fifteen thousand dollars. I haven't done it all, but in my head, really quickly, that's getting you to about twelve or thirteen thousand dollars right there. As far as um, as far as building that out, and that's gonna that is gonna look and sound great. <laughs> it also just just to make sure that you're clear is that oh you'll need a couple lights, and so there's your, there's the rest of your money. I, I'm using a bunch of NAND lights. Um, there's you know you'll need actual studio lights, uh, microphones. I mean, yeah, you have to decide what kind of mics that you need. Um, you know, if you're going to be in a noisy environment, a library, I was going to say noisy environment, like a library, but compared to a studio, a noisy noise environment, but, but, but you, um, you know, I, I really, you know, like if you're going to have, if you're doing really podcast podcasts, I would probably look at PR forties, um, you know, but you can really do SM 58s as you get started there. Um, you know, as something that's easy to use and rel relatively durable and easy to hold, or the big thing about the, the SM 58s is they're easy to hold. They're easy to, um, uh, 
you can hold them or you can uh, put, them put them on stand. stands, you know, that, that type of thing. So they're, they're kind of nice all around. And the big thing is, this is something that you can pack up and move around and you can go shoot things with it. Um, you know, like you can go out and, you know, you now have three cameras or four cameras that are able to go out and shoot amazing footage. Like my walk around camera that I shoot test footage with and all kinds of other stuff is that 6K and it's just stunning, stunningly good. Uh, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, you said 2470. Just make sure if he gets the 4K, it's a 12, uh, 12 to 35. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, or I would, I mean, I would still, I would take a little extra length, you know, it may get one of them that's wider so that you can get a full, a full shot in. And then the other ones be 24 to 70. So go ahead, Bill. Yeah. The only thing I would suggest if you're doing the black magic cameras, and if you decide you ever want to archive and try to edit the stuff, those big sensors make big files. So spend some money on hard drives or you will not <laughs> be able to use your footage afterwards. If you're going to shoot them, if you're going to record them locally. Yeah, absolutely. But you can all, you know, as you get started, uh, but in that in that side and and play with it think about that go out and price it figure out what we forgot um and if, if you're on discord we'll be able to keep on talking or bring it back up again like hey this is the list i did and, and you know we're happy to talk to you about that so um but i think that that's probably going to be man with that get that's the well that's the portable rig i'm building like i'm i'm waiting i'm not i'm in the process of first building two master controls this month but next or next month but when i get done with those i'm building these little portable kits and it's based on on what i just gave you is that like that to me price performance is the highest i could get uh, beju he also said he wants to be able to record it as well so you probably have to budget in a recorder as well so maybe going for the tv studio and the pockets in pocket uh, mini cameras rather than the 4k might work better for him so you can I, have high I, quality records. The, the mini pro it, will record right to a hard drive. Yeah. All you need is yeah, a hard mini, drive. Min, yeah, you just put yeah. a USB-C. It's a low res. Pro. It's a low res. It's a low res version, I think. Well, 1080. Use the, sacrifice the HDMI. But it's, yeah. he's, and all he cares about is 1080. So, and yeah. he can always do higher if he wants with the HDMI out. You know, like it's, you know, it's, so I, I would, I think that the, the, those cameras are something that you can shade. They give you, you can, you get a little bit, look, here's the deal. You know, I, I talk about this per, this this equation a lot. Is possible when poss when uh, possibility is greater than circumstance, you have action. It is like physics. It's like gravity. So when you start creating amazing footage and an amazing roundtables out of your library, you will get more money. <laughs> like, like you know, like like you know, like when it, when it, you know, like so the thing is, is you take your little bit, you keep your elbows in, and you just produce great shows, and people will be like. Oh my goodness. And they'll see the possibility of what, of what they could be doing and money will find its way. You know, there's money everywhere all the time. And it's just that it's, it's, you're just missing enough possibility to unlock it. <laughs> so, so, so you just have to, um, uh, you know, and if someone sees something that they get excited about, they, they figure out how to pay for it. It's kind of an amazing, uh, it's an amazing process, but they're literally just take on that there's money around you all the time for everything you want. And you just need enough possibility uh, to uh, to access it. And if you don't have it all the time, uh, and I haven't had it all the time, I've definitely lost lost connection with the possibility. <laughs> um, but and I uh, but but you can it, it's all there all the time. There's there's money for every every good idea if you can communicate it well or you can execute well. Carl and then Guy and then we'll move on. Very quick, um, work with your local tech rep. Uh, because I will, and, and Guy's coming up next, and Guy's crew has patiently saved me from walking off a cliff several times. Uh, you can return stuff easily, and they're a great source of information. Uh, Guy, you were going to say? Yeah, we've uh, actually got a lot of experience in this lately. We've been working with Oliver from Mimo Live. We developed a package for libraries that is lights, the camera, Mimo Live, and it's all on a cart. So when you get this thing, it ships to you in a cart, and it has a basic camera, SDI camera. But the idea is that, and this came from Penn State University from their library, uh, you take a USB stick, you put it in this uh, device, it turns on the lights, turns on the mixer, turns on the mic, turns on the video, and then when you hit this button, it's, it says three, two, one, and it starts recording. So it makes it super simple for kids to just come in, well, kids, I mean, college students, and, and this thing got adopted uh, by about 25% of the students y using this system. So it's something to look at. It's called One Button Studio. Um, Penn State has uh, some links, but really cool because it, to get that kind of adoption rate where kids are, you know, collapsing that time of renting uh, or checking out a camera, checking out some lights. It's just being able to walk into a room and walk out with the file on a USB stick, take it over to a Mac, edit it, and you're off and running. So I'd take a That's look great. at that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the big thing is, is yeah, definitely don't underestimate kids these days. You know, they, uh, <laughs> uh, I've been teaching 10 to 12 year olds, you know, for a long time. 
and they are completely capable of of running a very professional with a little bit of training and guidance and a little bit of practice they get really good really fast and so uh uh you know definitely for schools they should definitely i don't know when the kids are going to go back to schools but but when they when they when they're able to i'm always i always think it's crazy that schools don't have the kids doing more production just so they get good at it there's always a handful of kids that would that would get into that all right next question Hey, Alex, when we build your desk, we need to have an indicator of where you sit because you're off center today. Ah, much better. Okay. Nazim Beltran says pros and cons of using Amazon CloudFront services. I would say ongoing cost. <laughs> yeah, like, like, you know, like you're, you're, you know, when you're not, when you're, when you're going through them, you're, you just have to know that it's like rent. I mean, in everything you're doing, you have to keep track of it. I mean, I think the, the big thing is making sure you don't leave services on. I've, I've left services on and suddenly looked at like, not for too long, um, but I've, I've looked at them and gone, you know, I can't believe I just spent $600 last month. And because I left some process on, you know, somewhere down the road, or I left a, an instance on or other things. So you have to be, you have to be a little bit more procedural about turning things off and checking them regularly to make sure that they're they're not on and you can you can actually write into the code where it checks you know you can in the api you can have it check everything and send you warnings uh but but uh uh but while you're working on it i think that would be it um, i think the flexibility is kind of amazing go ahead bill yeah speaking of that i was somebody was talking about screencast and i have a couple of times gone into screencast mode to capture the screen forgotten to turn it off come back the next day and my computer hard drive is totally full so <laughs> we've done that <laughs> we've done that with elementals where we left them you know like the you you, you oftentimes with an with an elemental you set it to stream and then you automatically just add our all of our presets have an archive that captures what you're streaming just so you always have that last backup of an archive and we filled up the whole elemental drive you know on the on the archive because we left it on for two weeks you know like like it's you know like it was just running because it's just it's just it's on in the server room you turn it on for a test on youtube and then you just forget about it you turned off the youtube event and you're working on six other things and yeah it fills up the drive and then sticky you're notes help with that yeah yeah exactly george so Alex, um, one of the reasons Alex talks a lot, a lot about the link, and, I, and I'm, I'm doing a quick comparison with, with AWS and Wowza. So you, on Wowza, I'm still paying for all those services to leave my servers running. So I've been doing an event for six, the past six weeks now, every week. So I'm actually still paying for have those servers spin up. So on, on AWS, you actually not paying, for, you're paying for what you use. But when you're going to restream or aid, um, Wowza, you still paying for all those little services with a subscription per month. Yeah, and I, I, I prefer personally, I prefer the pay per use, but the subscription can be cheaper in some cases, it just depends on how you how you look at it there. Um, next question. Uh, Troy Warrior says, just like multi track audio, is there a multi track video recorder and playback for post cutting? just like live, think of video mix minus one kit. So it sounds like you. I so, yeah. uh, A couple of options. Aja has the Keypro Ultra, which lets you do either one 4K or four HD streams. Uh, Convergent Design has the Apollo, which lets you do four and a mix, local mix. And I believe Atomos also does it on the Sumo as well. And the new Samurai, you can do four HDs or one 4K. And, and you can also do it with the HyperDeck. Uh, you can do four 4Ks uh, on the HyperDeck 8K. So the, eight, the HyperDeck 8K will do four 4Ks at a time. And I believe when you play them out, it'll go out one at a, you know, like you can have four outputs and it'll just push them all out as separates, um, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so that's a pretty beefy solution. Um, I will say that I have bought the Apollo because I was super excited about it not as excited about it after using it <laughs> so so it uh you know it was mostly the constant crashing that 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 really took took the fun out of it um bill and then roscoe is it, i'm not sure because i don't do this but is softron in that space they're they're a cloud multi yeah yep. so uh not even cloud they have a soft softron replay as a software solution is another one that 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 can actually work really well so it'll record a whole bunch it'll you know i think you can do up to eight Maybe more. I think it's just it, it's listed of how much hardware you have, but I, I I haven't done more than eight on Softron. But that's a good that's a good point. It it does that well as well. Go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, if they uh, can d live with H.264, there's a future video that has a thing called V Station, which does I think it does 16 now. 
uh, but it, I know there's a four. I know it does four, and I does eight, and I think they're pushing it to sixteen. But it's H.264 encoded to the hard drive, but it's all synchronous. Our education department uses it for doing teacher evals. They That's have multiple great. cameras. They look at how the students are reacting and that kind of stuff, and so they can watch all the angles playback in real time. Ah, that's very cool. Um, next, we're going to go into the speed round. So we're going to start out answering Here questions relatively quick. Okay, next question. Greg Gibson says, how about a second hour one day on best practices for integrating Zoom into vMix? Yeah, well, Leland's going to start uh, joining us on Saturdays to do regular vMix discussions when he's available. So I think we can make that, you know, one of the things we talk about. Um, and, Absolutely. you know, and we can decide whether it turns into a whole hour. I think we're going to have a general discussion this Saturday, but I think that we can, Leland's going to be talking more and more about vMix um, on the Saturdays. And so um, we'll, we'll definitely put that on the list. Next question. Uh, Scott Lawrence says, I'm looking to help my kids school do a live stream with a basic ATEM mini setup. What do I need to worry about as far as network permissions when using my own MacBook Pro on the school's network? Go test it. Um, yeah, go test it. Um, I believe it's, I believe the ports that uh, YouTube lists the ports, I believe they're 80 and 1935 are the two ports that have to be opened. Um, you know, the, uh, um, but I, I think that you can go up to YouTube and it'll tell you what needs to be open for a network. We used to send something to clients, but it was literally cut and pasted from YouTube's you know, thing. So, so there's not anything special other than, you know, test it. Um, you know, oftentimes what we try to do, if, if they have an, a real at IT staff is to get something mostly routed open where they don't have anything closed up there's like a port for this period of time if they if they're sophisticated enough where they can set up rules they can set up rules for the event in a port and do it if they're not um which a lot of schools aren't uh then you want to have a discussion about opening certain ports which will be listed by youtube any any other uh and i would definitely take a backup schools are uh, it depends on the school but most schools are uh austerely managed <laughs> so i mean they just don't that's just not where they have the budget and so it, it, it can be a little bit challenging and usually i found that a third of the time i've ended up with uh cell my my, my wi-fi stream the show <laughs> when i if i if i if i'm at a high school you know k through 12 school um next next question next question kevin murphy says when picking a remote control solution for like an ATEM or a PTZ, et cetera. Do you prefer device agnostic web browser controls or a native apps like say iOS? It'll always feel better with a native app, whether it's iOS or Android, it'll always be snappier, a little bit, you know, faster. Uh, I like having at minimum a web solution, knowing that I can get into it and control it without having any kind of other setup. I think that, you know, knowing that I can just do an IP and if I can get a VPN or whatever, I can get to that device. Um, I love having that web interface. Uh, it's, you know, if you could choose, you know, and, and they're going to, and they both be ready at the same time with the, the same feature set, you know, you're always going to want, I mean, I think you're always going to want a native app. It's always going to work better and faster and be more responsive. But, um, but when that's not practical, I think, you know, knowing that it can connect is, is useful. Um, next question. Uh, speaking of noise assist from sound devices, how are people's experience with using it in the field? When is it preferable to use noise assist on the recorder versus noise reduction in post? I go ahead, Yashai. Uh, if you go live right away, definitely noise assist will be helpful. If you can take it to post and you have time and uh, and you have an RX, you can do probably much better job than uh, yeah. uh, voice assist. That's my take on it. Uh, Mickey and then Jesse. Oh uh, yeah, I, I'll just uh, echo what uh, Yeshai just said. If it's going through post, let post take care of it. We can, yeah. we can do more in post. Yep, yeah. uh, Jesse. Also uh, learning the types of noises that can be easily removed without artifacting is um, a nice exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, Summers. Does, does the sound devices not also give the, the option to record both ISOs? So one with the noise assist and one without? So you would just get yep. both of those. So you kind of covered there. Yeah, you, you can choose both. And uh, I believe you can. Anyway, you shy? No, no, you can. If When you put the, the, the plug-in on the channel, that's it. That's your ISO. So you already cook the noise reduction right there. 
but can you go but then Unless you can take it to a second channel which is clear yes. depending on what the recorder you have you can like if you have the eight series you can tell that to go to another channel i think so yes. i think that i think with the mix pre you can also send it to two Maybe, channels I have no um idea. yeah I, I believe you can send you can take you can take your input and, and route it to two different channels and yeah, you're probably you know, right alex yeah. yep yep absolutely yeah there's pretty the mix pre's are deep <laughs> uh mj what were you gonna say go ahead oh i was just saying i'm using the mix pre 10 with noise assist my mic is it's getting processed right now but i could move the noise assist to just the left channel of the main mix and record it that way if i wanted to right so um bill you know we don't use that system we use the cedar system often in post out there and i know i've had them send me a clean feed after noise reduction but they also always record the original and i've had extremely good results in having them post process that original to tweak it more because you're going to set it for the live voice in the field and then when you come back, it may be a little tune up will even improve and, things. And where and where a lot of times you're going to hear the processing is in the border between when someone's talking and when they're not. So the border between silence and and no, no silence, right on that on that edge, that field where it was forest to to, to uh, grass, in that little the brush right there is what you oftentimes hear. Um, the any of these noise noise uh, systems do is you'll hear it kind of come in and come out um, into that process. And so that's the thing to kind of listen for. And um, I, I would absolutely always want a non noise, you know, uh, I would always want the raw track if I'm gonna do anything with it in post. Uh, you shy? I just wanna add one more thing. Gain staging and really controlling the noise floor in recording sometimes will take you way further than all the reduction and everything because when you do yeah. that, then the we had a do miracles. We, we were in Vegas um, and uh, there's a, someone I'd like, love to get on to keep on adding to our incredible audio group here that we're building. But there's a guy named Steve Radcliffe who have done a bun bunch of work with. And, um, and Steve is really technical. And, um, and we were in Vegas and they, the mics were all over the place and there was tons of noise and everything else. And I was like, Steve, can you just go over there and talk to that guy for a minute? Because it was an executive and we had to absolutely, you know, his guy had to do his audio. I was like, can you talk to him? And then, and then like, half an hour late. Steve was great. He was just there talking to him and everything else and comes back and our audio is perfectly clean. And I said, what did you do? And he's like, gain stage. <laughs> you know, like it just, you know, it was just, it was just gain stage. Like all it was is a discussion about going through each piece, each, each thing that it's going through, what are its gain. And that's why, you know, tone is so important and everything else is, is getting all those things to be exactly where they need to be. Um, we'll remove as, as just shy said, sometimes half or more of the noise that you're hearing is just gain stage. Yeah. And where, where the two places you'll really hear the gain stage is that you'll hear a ton of noise, you know, in, in something that means that something came in low and then was moved high somewhere else, or it'll be distorted, but not loud. <laughs> that means that it's, it's hitting a ceiling somewhere. Um, and, but then, you know, but, and then going through there. All right. Uh, you shy. And then we're going to, okay, we're going to, I got to add really, last question. One more really fast. 15 incredible. seconds. Oh, okay. One more thing. If, if, if you use the cloud, cloud lifter, they have a, a very high spec of e, 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 EIN. If your mixer have a, not that as clean, that's another trick to reduce the noise level. And let's merge these last two questions, Chris, because I think they're, they're both from the same person. All right. So Tom Lothian is asking about Metashape. How difficult do you think it would be to use? Uh, is that what it is? Meta so bottom line is Tom's Tom, Tom's trying to learn MetaShape, and we did a we did MetaShape the fir in the first little bit of time, and we're going to kind of bring it back. Um, we're going to talk both about. I want to talk about both reality, uh, um, uh, reality is it reality capture and uh, and MetaShape uh, in the in the, over the summer, uh, where we're going to talk about um, shooting. I mean, the big thing with shooting is a MetaShape. You, know, you can get a demo version of MetaShape. You don't have to buy it immediately unless you're going to use the models. And the best way to learn, um, that really makes me dizzy, Cleveland. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, uh, the, uh, so MetaShape is a, um, uh, the best way to learn photogrammetry is to do a lot of it. Like it is, you have to learn how it's going to handle the photos that you're doing. You don't take things straight on. You're not doing orthographics. You, you want angles so that you can pr produce here's like really quick stuff i'm going to say in, in one minute that will hopefully help it'll save you a lot of time number one don't take orthographics they're not useful it needs to see vanishing points number two don't ever change your focal length number three try not to change focus so um so you, when you focus you're changing what meta shape has to calculate or what any photogrammetry has to calculate in what's in the frame um so you want to try to use a really small aperture so f11 or higher is what you're shooting for um, and if you can get to f16 or f22 
um, it is better to sh gain up than to, uh, it's better to have a higher gain image than a um, than open up your aperture. Uh, and I didn't believe that. Brent Schnarr told me that over and over and over again. I was like, oh, that's crazy. And he's right. So anyway, so as always, Brent Schnarr argues with me a lot and he's always, almost always right. So um, so anyway, so the, uh, so those are the kind of things, keep your aperture small, keep your focus the same, keep your focal length the same. Um, you know, you're moving a lot, get, get, you know, really think about the nooks and crannies, get oblique angles, not, not orthographics. If you do that, you're going to start getting some good models. And then after that, it's just practice, 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 you know, shoot it every day, throw something into meta shape, like a little, you just throw it in like sous vide. You know, like you just grab a bunch of photos, you throw it in, you go to lunch, you go 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 to bed. When you come back in the morning, remember they're, they're scripting. So you can have it do all the steps at one time. You say, just do all of these things and pop out a model on the other end. And then you'll see it and it'll be like, oh, that was horrible. But don't worry about it. And then what's going to happen is you'll learn how to shoot it. All right. That's a that's 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 the speed round version of that. We'll 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 do some more uh, more stuff uh, in the future. But now we have to change the subjects. And what's going to happen here is we're going to. For everyone. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to Carl for a couple minutes and then I have to actually go to another production again. Um, but, but, uh, but Chris will be uh, answering your, uh, will be throwing questions at Carl and continuing the conversation. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and clear the board, Chris, so that we can, uh, so this is an incredible opportunity to, uh, you know, Carl and I have worked on quite a few shows together um, where Carl's on the other, on the other side, you know, I'm dealing with putting bits on the screen. Carl is making sure that, that the bits have something useful to say. <laughs> so, so the, so the, uh, you know, and so we, you know, we kind of, uh, and I think we've worked on and off together for five years, you know, on different shows. And so, um, so anyway, so it, it was, it was, I was excited to have Carl, um, you know, come up and, and talk a little bit about it. How, Carl,